name is Peter McDowell. Um, it's a pleasure to be taking part with you in this service of worship. Um, just a little to tell you a little bit about myself in case you, you don't know who I am. Um, I was a Presbyterian minister for, for several years, um, latterly in Garneville Presbyterian, which is obviously not too far from Stormont. Um, currently, I'm a lecturer in Belfast Bible College. Um, the main subject that I teach um, is mission studies. So it's a pleasure to be with you this morning or to during this service of worship. And as we as we gather to worship, let's come together and pray together. Lord, we praise you that your purposes for us are not limited by time and space. Your love for us is not bounded by our selfishness or sin. Your grace reaches out for us even when we deliberately go our own way, and your truth gives us hope even in the darkest times. We praise you for Christ, for his coming to share all that life means to us, for his coming in fulfillment of all of your promises, for his death, which has opened up the way for us to know you and to experience your presence in a whole new way. We praise you for his amazing resurrection that fills us with confidence and assures us that you have accepted his sacrifice, not only for the sin of the world, but for our own sin and selfishness. We praise you for Christ's coming and walking with us, for his sharing of our journey. But we have to confess, O oh God, we have to confess that you you have asked for our hands that you might use them for your purpose. And we gave them for a moment, but then withdrew them for the work was hard. You asked for our mouths to speak out against injustice, but we gave you a whisper in case we might be accused. You asked for our eyes to see the pain of poverty, but we closed them because we did not want to see. You asked for our life, that you might work through our life, but we gave a small part so that we would not get too involved. Lord, forgive our calculated efforts to serve you only when it's convenient to do so, only in the places where it is safe to do so, only with those who make it easy to do so. O oh Lord, forgive us, renew us, send us out to be usable instruments to take seriously the meaning of the cross. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
As recorded in John's Gospel, Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. In our prayers for others, we ask for your peace, which passes all understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bring peace to all those who are troubled by illness or infirmity, grief at the loss of a loved one, suffering mental illness as a result of work pressures, difficult relationships, or poor self-worth, subject to bullying or intimidation, or anxiety as a result of money problems. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord, so we ask that your presence with them will strengthen and guide them as they seek a way out of their problems. In the silence, we name those whom we know that are in need now of your peace. We pray for peace in our families. So many families are broken by discord over sibling rivalries domestic violence, inheritance issues, or conflicting values. Lord, we seek your guidance for them in finding solutions to their situation, so that their family may be the place of acceptance, encouragement, and love that it should be. In the silence, we bring before you those families that we know need your peace today. We pray for peace in our church family. We pray that our fellowship here in Stormont may be a place in which everyone can find acceptance, encouragement and guidance, and where we may experience the joy of joining together with one voice in praise and worship to you and to our Lord Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, when self-importance, thoughtlessness and indifference take away from our fellowship and help us to keep Jesus firmly in our sights as our role model for our Christian life. In the silence, Lord, we bring before you our own failures to live up to his example and pray that you will bring peace and accord to our fellowship. We pray for peace in our city and our land. Thank you that we live in a place of relative safety and prosperity. Yet we know there are those in our community who don't have enough to eat. Those who are being intimidated because of their color, faith or ethnicity. Those who engage in violence against people with whom they disagree. Those who have fled from conflict situations in their home homelands and now find themselves as refugees in a foreign land, and those who have been trafficked into slavery. We pray that you will bring wisdom and integrity to our leaders as they seek to create a more equitable and fair society, and that you will open our eyes to injustice right on our doorstep. In the silence, Lord, we bring before you someone whom we know of in our community who needs your peace today. And lastly, for the big one, Lord, we pray for peace in our broken and turbulent world. We see regularly on our TV screens or in the press human suffering brought about by war, greed or intolerance. Environmental disasters such as drought, floods and species extinction caused by our own thoughtlessness. And examples of selfish actions by those who try to take advantage of others. And there are so many other instances that don't even make the headlines that we know nothing about. Great as some of these issues are, Lord, we know that nothing is impossible for you. 
and we pray for the restoration of your kingdom of justice and love in our world. In the silence, Lord, we bring before you our particular situation that is badly in need of your peace today. We bring all these prayers to you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from John chapter 6, verses 25 to 35. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. They said to him, What signs are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from the heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But there are some things that I wish I could change about church. One of the things I, I sometimes wish I could change about church is, do you know, I wish I could make church a little less spiritual. Yeah, but mm, that sounds a little strange, doesn't it? A little less spiritual church. Surely that's what church is all about. Well, sometimes I'm a bit concerned that we are so spiritual up here and all the stuff that we're talking about is uh, spiritualized and up here and we're not really dealing with real nitty-gritty life. For example, in this passage, Jesus is talking about bread. Now, bread um, in Jesus' era was the staple diet, the, the, the basic part of the diet on which everybody relied to get, um, to get their, their food every day. A bit like in some countries today, rice is the staple diet. In Ireland, generations ago, potatoes, the, the basic food stuff that forms the basis of every meal and the basis, therefore, of people's diet. And that's what bread was for Jesus and the people he was talking to. And Jesus, he talks quite a lot about bread if you actually read through the, the Gospels. And sometimes when he's talking about bread, it's clear Jesus is talking about the the physical stuff, the, the stuff that, that people ate, that they put in their mouths. And sometimes he adds an extra dimension of meaning to it. And it's clear that he's he's not just talking about the physical stuff that feeds our physical bodies, but he's there is an extra dimension of meaning. And we have to take that seriously. But sometimes I think we over-spiritualize. And in over-spiritualizing, we're taking sometimes the challenge away from it. We're relegating what Jesus says to some sort of ethereal realm up here and avoiding the disturbing challenge of what it says for everyday life. So, for example, we're used to saying um, in our prayers, give us this day our daily bread. And we don't think much about that. Um, and perhaps we spiritualize it. Lord, give me what I need. For a lot of the people that Jesus was talking to at the time when he taught his disciples to pray, give us this day our daily bread. He was talking to many people who were daily laborers. 
people who who relied on going to the marketplace every day and have come on someone coming along and say, come and work on my farm. And if someone did that and they worked for a day, they got paid. They got their daily bread. If no one came along, they did not get their daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread was a real nuts and bolts prayer for everyday survival and life. Now, the thing is, for most of us in the West, when that is not the way that we live. We, we live in a society where our basic needs are pretty much guaranteed. You may be familiar <coughs> with this um, diagram. Let me show it to you. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Maslow was a psychologist and he was trying to figure out um, about human beings and what makes them tick. And he, he argues that, there, that as human beings, we've got different levels of need. At the very base level of need, we've got physiological needs, the need to breathe, the need for oxygen, the need for food, for water, for sleep. These are the very basic needs that we need for survival. Once those needs are met, then he argued that we um, have need for safety and security, um, needs for employment, for the resources to live by. Once those needs are met, then comes the need for love and belonging and friendship and family and sexual intimacy. We go above that, we come to the need for self-esteem. For, for things in life that give us worth, that make us feel important, give us a sense of self. And above that, then we get to the, the level of self-actualization, um, um, where we're meeting the highest levels of need that make us feel um, that we're being fulfilled. Um, most people argue now it's not quite as simple as, the, as that um, only when one need is met do we feel the other needs, but they, they sort of interact. But my point is this, in the West, for most of us, bar some exceptional circumstances, the needs for safety and physio the physiological needs are by and large met for us. And we do not have to think about them. Now, of course, there are crisis times when we do, but by and large. And therefore, as a society, perhaps, we do not think of those things as relating to our faith. We do not see really that God has got much influence or much to say about those areas of life, except when we come to a crisis time. But we see that God is relevant in these higher levels when we're talking about self-actualization and self-esteem and maybe a bit long old. Now there, the Christian faith is relevant. But I want to argue that perhaps those of us in the West that can think like this, perhaps we read the Bible differently from people in other contexts. So in this passage that Jesus um, is, that we're, we're examining here, we come across a very, very famous verse um, in this passage that we're all familiar with, I am sure. Sorry, I'm trying to find the right slide. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so with our Western background where, where our basic needs are met, we assume and we jump straight to, oh, this is Jesus talking at a spiritual level. He's not talking about physical bread. And clearly he's not because... Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes me will never thirsty. He goes on about talking about eating and drinking his body and his blood. Obviously, he's adding an extra dimension of meaning to this, to what he's talking about. But I want to imagine that you are reading this passage not from the position of a relatively well-off, stable Western person. How would you read Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall hunger. How would you hear that if you are a refugee in a Syrian refugee camp? 
how would you respond to Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will hunger if you are living in a shanty town or favela in one of the major cities of the world. How would you read, how would you hear this passage if you are one of the many people, even in our own city now, who have to rely on a food bank for your basic needs to meet, to, food, to feed your family? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not be hungry. Or if you're on a zero hours contract, and you're not actually getting enough hours to feed yourself and your family. I think, I think we have to say that, yes, Jesus is obviously adding a spiritual dimension to this. But perhaps these people, when they hear Jesus say this, would be saying, yes, Jesus, but what about my daily bread? Do you mean, are you really saying that I will never be hungry? And even if you are talking about a spiritual thing, I'm still physically hungry. So I think we would read these words and engage with these words very differently if we were in some different contexts around the world. I don't think these people would, would accept us just saying, oh, but it's just spiritual talk. This would mean something much more, and it would raise a que um, questions much more um, for people like this. So I don't think we should just jump to a spiritual interpretation and spend, think that Jesus is purely talking about spiritual needs. I think people would want some more than that. And I think even ourselves, actually, do you know when we come down to it, come down to it ourselves, what keeps us awake at night is often not the spiritual things. Often what keeps us awake at night are the very practical things that, that are on our hearts and minds. It does often come down to finance. It does often come down to things that are in the everyday world. And so if we just relegate Jesus to the um, to the spiritual realm, we are missing something. What about some of the other phrases that are in this passage and how we and how others might relate to them? So what about this verse? Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which is the Son, the son of Man will give you. Food that endures to eternal life. Oh, again, we're up in the spiritual plane. Yes. Yes, but I can imagine the daily labourer, I can imagine the, the refugee, I can imagine the person going to the food bank saying, yes, but Jesus, Jesus, I need to work to get bread on the table tonight. Are you saying that I can opt out of all of this? Obviously not. Is Jesus saying to us as a community of his people, um, do not work for bread that perishes? Is he saying, guys, I want you to opt out of the economic system, to go away and to form some sort of a, for a commune where you can grow your own stuff and you don't have to do all this um, horrible work in the everyday world? I don't think he is saying that. And so then we are left with a position because, do you know what? Again, it's not just daily laborers who will be saying, hmm, but I do have to work for food that prices. Most of us have to hold down a job or do something to make sure that the everyday bread comes in. So I'm not going to give you answers. But it raises the question, if Jesus says, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, how do we balance what he is saying there with the real practical need that most of us have to earn a living or to do something to ensure that there is food on the table every day? Now, that is something I cannot give you the answer for what that looks like for you. 
That is something where you are going to have to weigh and think about the balance. What I do for everyday life, for the physical needs, my work, all those sorts of things. How does that balance with this command to not just focus on that, but to make sure that I'm focusing on something more enduring? What does that look like? Is that balance right in my life at the moment? Nobody else can answer that one for you. Only you can answer that for yourself. Well, I'd say I would argue that is something for you to work out with God. Because it's a relationship. It's something to work out with him. And I would argue perhaps something that we do not do actually is, is to talk to each other about it. To ask each other, how, how are you working out that balance? What does it look like for you? Everyday life, the real everyday responsibilities versus the longer term, the spiritual, the what the question about what is life about and am I am I focused on that enough? Obviously, if we begin to think about this sort of thing, it, it's going to affect our everyday life. It's going to involve making choices about how we spend time, what we invest in, both with time and money. We have to make choices and decisions, and, and that will mean doing some things but not doing others. It involves choices. And then perhaps we want to say to Jesus, well, what sign are you going to give us that the way you're pointing us to is the right way? That's the question that the people in the crowd asked Jesus in this passage. How are you going to prove to us, Jesus, that what you're saying is right? And that therefore, if we make choices according to this, it's going to be worthwhile. It's really interesting that this question comes and this whole discussion comes pretty much just after Jesus has fed the 5,000 people and they have seen him do it. So he's just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish. And now they're saying, Jesus, what sign are you going to give us? I'm tempted to ask, what more of a sign do you need? What sign is Jesus going to give us about the decisions that we have to make about our life and how we balance it and the priorities that we set? What sign is he going to give us? Well, I think this hints to us that quite often the signs are there. That it's, it's about looking back and noticing and paying attention to the signs that have been there and that are there in our lives up to now. Because it's looking back and seeing, yeah, actually, do you know what? When I've, when I've gone this way, it has worked out. When I have risked, God has provided. Um, and if we do not pay attention to the small things that God does day by day as we seek to live this out, if we're just waiting for a miraculous sign that, that hasn't been yet, we're probably going to be a bit disappointed. And maybe it's more about actually paying attention to what God does in each day, through each day, how he's been with us with difficult times in the past. And actually, it's worked out. God has been faithful. So, Let's not jump to spiritualizing everything, to keeping everything up at a level up here where it doesn't touch our everyday lives. I think if we do that, we've got a faith that is safe, but really doesn't connect. Let's not just spiritualize, but let's connect with the everyday, the nitty gritty of our lives. Let's make sure we've got the balance as we feel it, it should be. And let's make sure that we're paying attention to see what God does and is doing day by day so that we, we notice the signs that he is giving to us.
Well, as we close our time of worship, let's pray together. Gracious God, as we go to our homes and our work this coming week by the power and promise of your spirit, open our ears to hear what you are saying to us in the things that happen to us and in the people we meet. Open our eyes to see the needs of people around us. Open our hands to do our work well, to help when help is needed. Open our lips to tell others the good news of Jesus and bring comfort, happiness and laughter to other people. Open our minds to discover new truths about you and the world. Open our hearts to love you and our neighbours as you have loved us in Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>